Oh, hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. It's me, Cindy Howes, the host of the podcast. Basic Folk is on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. We are a listener-supported pod, and you can join us by supporting us online at basicfolk.com slash donate. If you give at least $5 a month or $60 for the entire year, you'll get access to our very fun and cool bonus episodes called Backstage. And you can, again can check that all out at our website. That's also where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. And you can follow us on social media at Basic Folk Pod. The LA-based singer-songwriter Amy Correa will tell you that she is not a prolific writer, which, okay, maybe she doesn't write a million songs in one year, But holy crap, those songs and that voice will wallop you. Originally from Lakeville, Massachusetts, Amy's musical roots lay in New York City's Lower East Side in a scene that produced Jeff Buckley, Richard Julian, and Jesse Harris. She discovered her musical voice while recovering from a back injury her junior year of college. She was actually a big fan of laying in bed and doing nothing but writing songs and playing around on her guitar. After college, she was playing around and got offered a major label record deal, recorded an album with seven different producers and countless musicians, left her label, signed another deal, which would eventually become the place where she released her debut album, Carnival Love, in the year 2000. Another album followed in 2004 and another in 2010. She opened for big acts like Chrissy Hine, John Hyatt, Richard Thompson, and Mark Cohen. She started living in Boston, fully embraced by, quote, a collective of musicians who uplifted her with their creative camaraderie, which included Kimon Kirk, who turned out to be one of her most important friends and collaborators. Kimon encouraged Amy to record this new batch of songs on her latest release, the EP As We Are, which just came out in March of 2022. During our conversation, Amy revealed that the recording session took place in 2015, but she wasn't ready to release the music until now. Kimon had persuaded her to revisit the songs during the pandemic, and the plan was set in motion for the EP. We also discussed Amy's connection to spirituality, her affinity and experience in the theater world, and and letting go of control. She also opens up about her relationship to her singing voice, which is so special and always digs deep in me every time I hear it. I hope you enjoy this wonderful and vulnerable conversation with Amy Correa. We're going to check out a song from her new EP, As We Are, and get to our conversation. This is Sweet Things from Amy Correa on Mesic Folk. This is a song for no one. Sung in a key that cannot be sung A song that'll never be heard by anyone Under the sun This is a life that we're living These are the things that we have been given Oh, sweet things Sweet things are given And sweet things are taken away Oh, sweet boy, I thought I'd see you tomorrow And now I'm trying to remember Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's so nice to see you. It's great to see you, Cindy. Thanks for inviting me. Let's get into this. I am so excited. Uh, The last time we talked, I think, was 12 years ago in Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. Yeah. So we have a lot to catch up on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you grew up in Lakeville, Massachusetts, which is pretty close to Cape Cod. I grew up in Walpole, Massachusetts, which is about like... 35, 40 minutes away, but I actually had to like look it up on a map because I don't know about you, but like <laughs> if it's outside of like a half an hour of Walpole, I'm like, I don't know where. The, um, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, I don't know where Walpole <laughs> Heard of yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's next to uh, Foxborough, like where okay. the Patriots is there play. A pr- yeah. Is there a prison there? There sure is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the state prison. That's why I've heard of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, in Lakeville, growing up in the 70s, listening to the radio, mm-hmm. that's like where you really got into music. 
Queen playing after Bob Dylan, followed by Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> and I'm always interested to like hear people's, especially a musician's relationship to radio, particularly in like the younger years, like its importance and its impact. So what did the radio do for you as a kid? And where else were you finding music growing up? Mm, I love that question. I can remember listening to the radio from the time I was a, a little girl in the car and the different radio stations and learning the tunes and singing along to them. Do you remember which stations, by the way? I mean, no. What is it? WRKO. What is that? That just came into my mind. Do you remember that? From, that was an AM station, yeah. It was an AM. <laughs> we're going. I think so. I think so. But I felt like WRKO. That just came to my mind. Um, I remember WAF, W-A-F. That was when mm -hmm. I was older. Like, I don't know. I don't really know the, the, the stations when I was a really little kid. Um, I just remember there was a lot of music in the car, traveling around. We had an eight-track tape deck. You, that's probably before your time. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see one of those in a car, though. <laughs> yeah. You're right. These things were, I think it was in the car. And, you know, but, but back to the radio part of it. It was always a surprise. I think that element of spontaneity and the element of curation, which now we don't have, you know, being able to trust another human being to deliver certain um, songs, certain artists to you, and sort of trusting that. We don't have it anymore. I, I didn't really listen to Apple Music until very recently. I was kind of just 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 wasn't wasn't really relating to it you know so now it's it's a wonderful tool to have to be able to access all these songs but there's there's something missing too um lately i've been listening to you know a lot of different streaming radio um from the uk and ireland and really learning about new artists like, i feel like that was how we were introduced to things that we never heard of before there's there is just so much out there to to, to discover that to have um these trusted people that can sort of point us to things, reveal things mm -hmm. to us. So yeah, as a kid, it was um, it, it was an adventure. That's what it was like. And it connected you to the outside world because I grew up in a little town. Mm -hmm. That was a big part of my introduction to music was that there's a world out there that's so much bigger than I am. And the, the musicians that I would listen to, like um, Delta Dawn, I can't remember that. There were certain songs that just really I keyed right into in terms of their feeling. I don't think I understood what the song was about entirely. And then Rhinestone Cowboy was another one. Being, mm. you know, in the early 70s and looking at the cracks in the sidewalk, like when I was four or five and going, I know what you mean, man. I know every... <laughs> yeah. It was so, it's, it's, it, was, it was cool to have, to have that exposure. My parents love music, but the radio was a big part of discovery. That's cool. Uh, in terms of faith, you grew up Catholic, same yes, year. Yes, a, a yes. Mass, a Massachusetts Catholic, one of those fun, loving Joe Biden, Kennedy Catholics. Um, right. <laughs> in interviews, you've talked about being spiritual and in songs in the past and even on your new EP, you've met God has gotten name checked. Um, the opening number on the new EP, all we have to give the world and God is ourselves as we are. Right. Um, yes. So can you talk about your experience with religion as a young person and how that introduction to religion has permeated into your adulthood? Mm, that's another interesting question, Cindy. Um, I remember, you know, I grew up in Middleborough, Mass, until I was five, and we used to be able to walk to church. And I can remember, uh, like, holding on to my parents' hands and them swinging me. And so I didn't have a terrible connotation with church. That was family. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little emotional because of that memory, but. Yeah, um, that's a good one. It's a, it's really not. I mean, now other, other memories are coming too <laughs> of, you know, um, you know, sort of realizing that there was a man on, on a cross <laughs> and he was bleeding mm -hmm. and, and he was dead, you know, or, or that's, that's the image of a child, you know, seeing you know, this barely clothed man, because at the mm -hmm. church, there was, it wasn't, um, it was very graphic. And that was confusing, I think, you know, to understand, you know, what's this all about? A man was crucified on a, on a cross to save our sins. What do we do? Like, wh what did we do that caused this terrible thing to happen to this other man? So I think yeah. Catholicism actually introduced to me a lot of questions, which I'm grateful for, because I think that, you know, some people, I think if they didn't grow up 
with religion, I wonder if they ever even had to ask themselves questions. So that's that to mm. me, religion was an entrance to to just asking those big questions. Mm. Um, you know, growing up, I started to I think when I was twelve, my I had a cousin who, who informed me that there was no God, which was I I I, be, I believed her actually because she was somebody <laughs> that I felt knew. She was from New York. You know, people yeah. from New York, we assumed they knew more than we did from Massachusetts. Yeah. So, <laughs> so to a she, point. To a, no, no, that's all been <laughs> stripped. That's believe me, that's all been stripped away. But as a child, <laughs> you know, you're, you're looking for answers, and you know, a little bit of an older relative comes to town from from a place like New York, and you think they know something. And and I really took it seriously when she told me that there was no God because I I sort of trusted her. Um, wow. As somebody who had more information than I did, and I thought, well, well why, are, why are my parents believing in this? And, you know, it, it really did bring up some conflict. Um, I, I, I balked at getting confirmed. I remember that. I did go through confirmation, which is in the you Catholic. Yeah, in the Catholic Church, it's when, you know, you're, you're, you're supposedly an adult making a conscious choice versus like your first communion where you're, basically your parents are making you do this and you're in the second grade. Mm-hmm. But there was always a lot of mystery around around that faith for me. It, there wasn't a lot of intellectual like discussion about it or trying to understand. So I think that the main thing is that it brought up a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. And I think the other part of it, I would say, is that I didn't really know how to relate to God or this idea of God personally mm-hmm. till much, much later in my life. I mean, literally till like very recently in the last five years to even understand yeah. what that meant. Yeah, that's a bit. That's a huge question. That's an interesting question. Like mm. um, in the song, I mean, if there's so much to it. Do you want to? Maybe I should stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Keep a little bit for yourself on that one. Yeah, that's. Uh, I've I've noticed people sort of like ask you here and there, uh, but never like actually ask you directly. So I do. I appreciate sharing all that. That's. I, I really liked your answer. I mean, I love. I I love talking about it. I mean. To me, it's it's like a central part of my life, but it's like it is hard to talk about because I don't I don't really I how do I say it I don't um, follow any one religion, mm-hmm. but yet I I do sort of appreciate and I feel a, I feel a kinship with Catholicism. I don't go to church and I don't really ascribe to a lot of what the church even teaches, at least overtly about like a connection to God or even what God is or the deepest reality of our lives like like but but I can still sort of really deeply appreciate it Jesus I, I'm I definitely you know appreciate my understanding of of who he was and what happened in his life and the messages that he had mm. I mean I I actually took a vow as a Buddhist um maybe six years ago but it was it was an interesting decision because I, I longed to have a faith, but honestly, I've just, I've now elapsed Buddhist in a sense, mm. <laughs> because I just, uh, an organized religion uh, is, is, is tricky for me. But I, I certainly draw from the great traditions. I keep trying to learn more and I, and I just try to have an understanding that there is a higher power mm. that I don't understand, but that, that I want to, and that I try to relate to in my own way, whether meditation, prayers, just various ways. And and I do, I mean, I guess when, when you take a vow, a vow as a Buddhist, the terrifying thing is that now you're locked in for eons of time. <sighs> right, because <laughs> of reincarnation. <laughs> well, yeah, and you're making a vow, like a vow is a very powerful thing, right? Like mm. I've never been, I've never taken a vow. Have you ever, I mean, have you ever taken a vow in your life? I'm about to. <gasps> oh, you're getting married. <laughs> Yeah. That's awesome. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. That'll be my thank you. It'll I think that'll be my first one. But your, I'll keep your you first posted vow. how it yeah. goes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I mean vows are really powerful because um how where else in our lives do we get to make that kind of kind of commitment? It's not just a commitment, it's something deeper, right? Mm. And I know, yeah. you know, the divorce rate is high and so forth, but I still feel like there's so much power and I think I was longing for that that kind of choice and commitment. You know, I, it's like I say, I'm a lapsed Buddhist. I mean, I think that simply means that I, I just continue to question and try to seek like a real connection with who I truly am, you know, with the, mm. deepest, the deepest part of myself and, and the connection we have with, with each other. 
Well, this question might relate to that a lot, actually. So you named your second record Lakeville after your hometown and also an idealized place. You said the inner spiritual space and creative wellspring that I keep finding my way home to. So what has that space been like for you recently and how do you maintain or take care of that place? This is so cool. I love these questions. Um, Well, I mentioned prayer and meditation. Um, I do feel like that's really important to me right now. Um, I would say in the last five or six years, specifically, um, I'm not a regular, like I'm not, you know, terribly disciplined, but I do come back to it and find different ways to do that. This is going to sound so like, (laughs) as my mother would say, would you be doing this if you weren't in California? And I was like, probably (laughs) not, but (laughs) but here I am, you know? Um, No, I've been, I've actually in the, lately, I would say for the past three months, I I take like a a book like this one right here, like that you get at Michael's art store, because it's so solid. It's a hard cover and it feels so, yeah, blank pages and I, <laughs> and I write for like three, it's like kind of like morning pages where you just right. write down and I kind of focus on positive things because part of my mind is like, and I don't know if it's part of the Massachusetts lineage of like, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know if it's like a defense mechanism where you just kind of get negative, but I, I have a very negative mind naturally. So in the mm-hmm. mornings I go through all of like what I'm grateful for and you know, who I am, who I want to be, what, you know, how I want this day to unfold and how I want to conduct myself in it. And then this is the funny part, the California part that my mom makes fun of a little bit. I actually, (laughs) I, I shuffle the tarot deck because it's fun. And I love the art. I love looking at the images and I love kind of entering into these impressions of these of these iconic archetypal scenes. And then sort of Mm -hmm. like, it's a, it's a game. It's a tool. It's sort of, it's not like I'm looking into my future and I believe, although I do feel like there is, there is something kind of something that's mysterious about too. Some of it's uncanny, you know, Um, when you pull, you pull a card, you know, and you're like, wow, that really, that really informs my day. So that to me is a type of connection. um, Mm, I like that to like a deeper intuition because you can sort of like project onto it what you need, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's, <laughs> and you know, in terms, you know, I, I like to look at spiritual books. I have a lot of spiritual books. Um, I like to dip into them and take something out. Actually, the quote that you said earlier from the song is actually from Jung. Um, he said that. Mm. Uh, he said, all we have to give the world and God is ourselves as we are. I that like was that. Yeah. that that in his cool. mind. I think it was it was also related to the, not just like as we are, like let's let it all hang out, but like doing that work on yourself where you actually become really acquainted with even the the darkness, the depression, the rage, whatever it is. Um, because he's you know part of Jung's thing was that all of that repressed stuff is what is evil. It's like that's what causes wars. That's what you know, mm-hmm. we, we see around us because on an individual level, we're not really dealing with it. So it, it, it comes out, you know, it comes out in these in last, like reactive ways. Yeah. We were talking about the Massachusetts thing and like having like a negative brain. And I wanted to um, just go back to that for a minute because I completely relate to that. Um, have you ever heard of negative bias? Not really, no. What's that? Okay, so I'm not an expert, but I like read the Wikipedia page about it. Um, (laughs) So it's like negative negative bias is kind of like that voice in your head that's telling you that like, don't take the risk. You're not good enough to take this risk, yada, 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 because it's trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's like an old, it's like leftover from like caveman days where Mm. we had to worry about saber tooth tigers attacking us and stuff like don't leave the cave you're gonna get attacked you know and so it's just your you're like this like million year old or several thousand year old thing that's like left over in your brain that hasn't like caught up to evolution so 
Yeah, the negative. It's just interesting. Yeah. Well, the negative bias is, is protection, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt that that was my entire music career. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it really relates to it because I was always um, like very guarded, very uncertain. And, but that negative, like, it was very hard for me to believe when good things were happening. You know, something wonderful would happen. You'd get a record deal. And it was like, my reaction was very rarely cel celebratory. It mm -hmm. was fear. Because it was, I was getting ready for, you know, something to go wrong. And, you know, right. maybe it is ancestral. Maybe there is something to that. Or, you know, I, I do believe sort of like we come into the world with tendencies. So I might have just come into the world that way. But to the Massachusetts side, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of our, our ancestors are from other countries or immigrants. Maybe they had hardships and maybe there is something that we've, you know, that's been passed on that's, you know, we're going to bolster ourselves against the elements mm. and against whatever we're up against, even the unknown, you know, coming to a new place. When you think, yeah. about, I don't know when your family came here, my, on my parents' side, on my mom's side, the Irish side came, I think, two generations ago. Mm -hmm. And Same. my dad's side, similar from Portugal. My dad's side was on the Mayflower. <laughs> No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Like a, I'm sure <laughs> like fascinating. 80 percent of the people that you knew growing up with also kind of had that. OK. Heritage. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, there could be something to the New England that were, you know, hardy people, strong people um, and really like literally pioneers. So it makes sense that 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 part of our brain, that mm. the negative bias. I like that. I hadn't heard that. Oh, man. Amy, we could talk all day. Uh, I, have, I have other I have other interesting questions to talk about with you. Um, I wanted to ask you about your experience with education. So you uh, talked about that your your parents didn't go to college, and right. you said I think it was foremost in their mind to give me and my brother as much education as we could stand. In my case, I was really into it. Right. So what did that look like in reality, and how do you reflect on your educational experience now? Oh yeah. Well, I was a I was a good student. I loved school. I loved the pencils. I loved the notebooks. I loved, you know, the outfits. Like I loved going to school. I mean, I was a little nervous. I can remember as a child not wanting to get on the bus, scared to leave my mom, you know. Mm -hmm. And um <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking, you know, I, I always I was always had an ambiguity about like kind of going off into the world as much as I kept pushing myself out there. But education for me was really important. Um because I was, it was something that I was kind of good at. And I don't know if that was probably just my natural intelligence, but also like my desire to, to please, you know, um, the teachers. Right. <laughs> like, look what I did, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and I guess you learn, you know, you get the positive reinforcement. Um, it's funny, I was just li listening um, this morning about 4 a.m. to this documentary about a professor at Harvard who did a study about how, you know, in the black community that there's like a negative connotation. He, he studied that there was, a, there was a correlation between doing well in school and being less popular. Anyway, I literally was just listening to that to this morning. And, you know, for me, it was, you know, being a good student, maybe I didn't notice that the other kids didn't like me. But to me, I, I just didn't, to me, that was a, that was a virtue. It was something to that I felt good about myself. So that sort of snowballed. And, you know, by the time I was in eighth grade, that cousin I mentioned, who mentioned, you know, about there not being a God, she was going to a prep school. So that put the the idea in my mind that, you know, maybe I could do that. So there was another girl in my public school who was going to Tabor Academy in Marion, Massachusetts. And I've heard about Tay and I thought, what is that? That sounds interesting. So in eighth grade, I got the you know, those brochures, the color brochures, brought them home, put them out on the kitchen table. And it was like, that was a whole other world. That was, you know, opening yeah. up a whole other um, dimension. And for whatever reason, intuition, you know, how I grew up, I, it was like, yeah, that's for me. And my parents, who are always very supportive um, in all of like the things that all their kids have done in the in their lives, um, you know, well, let's see. Let's see if we can work. Let's see what this is all about. Let's go down there. I ended up, you know, going there, getting money to go there. And then that led me to actually going to another really prestigious prep school um, called Phillips Andover, which I, I went 
my senior year. So I left in the, you know, which was kind of weird because I, mm -hmm. I was, I only had my senior year at this other school. Um, but I don't know, there was something in me that just kept pushing me out. I, I mean, when I look back on it now, I do feel a little bit of regret because I think I was just really uncomfortable with myself. And I kept trying to like go out there and like, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't all negative, but I think I didn't realize, you know, what Tabor Academy had offered me in terms of like, it would have been a little more loyal for me just to stay there mm -hmm. and like see myself through that course. Um, but it hadn't even occurred to me. Like at that time, I was just finding my way towards, you know, the next thing. And mm -hmm. uh, look, I was even at that age, I was quite depressed. So I was I was always sort of trying to find some like place, you know, it goes mm -hmm. back to the song Lakeville, you know, like trying to find that peace within myself. Yeah. Of course, looking in the wrong places, right? How did you deal with your depression when you were that age? Oh, gosh, I wore a black trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> even on even on sunny days. <laughs> um, no, I'm laughing because I, I mean, I mean, we're, I think it was a very common thing. I mean, back in those days, it was the 80s. And I don't think we talked about, you know, teenagers with depression as much as we do now. Mm -hmm. um, um, how did I really deal with it? Like, did you did you know that it was depression? I don't know if I called it that. I don't know if I called it that. I mean, the earliest time I ever went to see a therapist was in eighth grade, and and they all said I was fine. They said you're great. You're you're you know you're a diamond in the rough. You're fine. Like go on with your life. So I, I never nobody really, you know, they Not did helpful. a brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like you're fine. I'm like I'm fine, but why do I feel like this? Um, so I never, you know, tried any medication at that age or anything. Uh, music, you know, music, even though I wasn't yeah. playing music, I think I really escaped into music and the world of, honestly, of, of like 60s and 70s rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very adolescent. It's very typical. But I had like my, my walls covered in, you know, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Small Faces and Rod Stewart and, you know, Cream and Jimi Hendrix and... I just thought those people were like, their world to me was a world of freedom and I wouldn't even say joy. Like I just, I just was like, I would just kind of go off into that, that world listening to music. Yeah. So creativity was part of that. Um, I was at the time like writing, I wrote a play when I was a junior and had a big production <laughs> one night only sold out. <laughs> no, but it was great. It was called Stray Cat Alley. Uh, it was about this person who <laughs> it's about this person who had imaginary friends. So there were two other characters that the main character would like sort of interact with. But no, I think creativity was was a big part of how I survived. Um, and I say survive, that sounds so dramatic, but it, that's what it feels like, you know, when you're going through it. Yeah. Definitely. And like, you're the only one. That's how, you know, my right. teenage experience. And, right. And nobody understands. Um, Except for Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix understood. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You were talking about theater. And I did have a question that relates to theatrics. I read that you did an off-Broadway musical called Fallen Angel. Is this a, a true fact? Uh, it is a true fact. Uh, when I was yeah. when I was at Barnard College, because eventually I ended up at Barnard, um, and I was doing theater there, which was not easy because it was an all girls, all women's college, and mm. there's not that many. Like we we would do like a female version of Pinter's, you know, The Caretakers, which is about men really. Mm. But <laughs> we, oh, we interesting. Doing, yeah, it was it was great. I, I really actually thought I wanted to be an actress before I discovered music because I didn't discover myself as a musician till the middle of, I guess it was my sophomore year. Even though I picked mm. up a guitar at my um, senior year of high school, I didn't really start writing songs till I was in college. So one day somebody came back to the dorm, hey, there's just auditions down at the Off Off Broadway Theater, La Mama, they're looking for, you know, songwriters. And I had a couple of songs Carnival Love was one of them, oh, which, was hey. my, which was on my first album. So I auditioned, 
and I got the part and yeah, I did, um, I played the part of the singer songwriter and that went on. We actually did, we actually did it in Chicago too. It actually oh, had, wow. it had a run in Chicago and then it came back to New York. And at that time I was replaced by Lisa Loeb, I think, oh. All right. <laughs> which hurt. Yeah, it hurt. Oof. Wow. <laughs> but then she dropped, something happened, like she didn't end up doing it, it with somebody else. And they, oh, they asked what happened. They actually came back because she couldn't do it. And they asked me, but that time I was like, no, I can't do it. I'm, yeah. I'm not available anymore. Sorry. You know? no, um, and I wasn't actually because I had a day job. So I, I actually wasn't available. So that's really interesting about Fallen Angel. I just like read like a sentence about it, but that's an interesting history of, of your Fallen Angel experience. And you also um, played the role of Persephone, an early concert performance of Aeneas Mitchell's uh, musical Town. I cannot help but notice like the theatrical vibe on some of these new songs, like particularly The Beggar. Um, mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit more about like your relationship to theater performing and then also working that theatrical aspect into your music? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, um, acting was really my first love in terms of like being a performer. And I started acting in high school just in the, in the different productions. Um, and then of course in college and then the off-Broadway experience you know, actually, you reminded me, like, I think it was during that Fallen Angel period where I thought, I definitely don't want to be an actress because I want to have more autonomy. Like, I hated, I hated that they could replace me with, with another performer oh, so yeah. easily, so easily, and that I had no say in it. I hated that. <laughs> and, I, and I really, there was something about, like, being a songwriter where I, I felt like I could have more control over how I was going to put my work into the world. And, you know, that turns out to be, that was sort of a, not entirely true because then I got signed to labels and, you know, the autonomy, you immediately are not autonomous. Now you're part of a corporation. But I feel like I'm definitely coming back to the, the theatrical side of my talent I, I just saw Janice Ian speak at McCabe's, which is a guitar sh a shop out here. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't realize that she studied with Stella Adler, who's a great theater teacher, like a guru, really. She's wow. like one of the main main ones in New York. Um, and that Janice Ian herself taught acting. Like, I didn't know that about her, mm. which is interesting. Like, I do think there's something about songwriting and storytelling and theater that all converges and, you know, with Aeneas's piece, that was, wow, that was so exciting to see how she developed and evolved that. It was like, for yeah. all of us, was just kind of like, just, it was like, it was mythic. Like, it was like, wow, like, just to watch her, you know, what I saw was the, the way that she collaborated and pulled everyone into it. And yeah. just like bringing all of these lights into this one great light it was just really powerful to witness and certainly ignited my interest again my own aspirations you know to to be more of a performer in that way in in on the stage or mm. whether through um film or theater so actually with the the video i don't know if you saw the video of the beggar mm -hmm. yes so that was a lot of fun my friend jesse who's out here in california who's, who's also a musician but is a an aspiring filmmaker. That's really her the first video that she's made. Whoa. Which is very pretty sophisticated. I'm waiting for the HBO Max series <laughs> based off of that video. Right? Hysterical. Yeah. It was very avant-garde. Like we had so much fun. Like it re definitely reminded me of like when I was 15 and 16 and that sort of freedom where you're really like having fun with your ideas and your creativity and you're not really you, you don't really even imagine anybody's gonna see it in a way. You're really not making it for an audience. You're kind of like, you know, it was actually during the pandemic. She was one of the few people that I would see regularly. She would come over to my place. We'd have coffee, pancakes, and we would talk about things. And we started talking about, my God, I'm going to put in, I'm going to put music out. I haven't put music out in like 12 years. Like I was, that was terrifying. And I said, I don't know how to even, what does that mean? You put, what do you put it out? How, where? And we started talking about doing videos. And um, so that's sort of, 
you know, interest in theater, we started talking, like I started telling her about, you know, my roots and interest in theater. And she's like, I'm getting this image of you just sitting in front of a mirror backstage. Oh, yeah. And that's I was like, like, that's cool. Yeah, like the theatrical lights around the mirrors. Right, right. And I was like, that's really interesting. I said, and she's like, and I see you running outside into a car. Like there's a car waiting for you in the alley and you run outside into the car. And that's all, that's how that whole, you know, video started, which ended up being this exploration of, you know, you know, my shadow and like confronting my shadow. <laughs> so fun right <laughs> yeah yeah because you're at one point you're all dressed in one of you is dressed in black and then the other one is dressed in like a pink right a pink robe yes and it was funny because we did in in that video I wasn't sure like first we thought the one we thought that maybe the beggars you know quote unquote the beggar kind of shadow side was going to be you know the one that was being haunted, but it turns out like it actually was. It's really interesting because the, the two were actually shared. They're part of the same personality. So, hmm. you know, if you were to say, well, which one represents the beggar? Which one's you know the the good you or whatever? <laughs> like the not like. <laughs> and I, I don't think you can kind of pull the two apart. They're just kind yeah. of one, one of the it's same. Not that simple. Yeah. But yeah, I I really well, I'd love to put that out there, man. I would love to like. I would love to do more acting and get into like, like audition for indie films or, or theater. And now that I'm in Los Angeles, I feel like there may be opportunities. Mm. I want to go back to telling your story a little bit. So when you were 17, you went to New York at Bernard College. Um, you left your junior year because of a back injury. So then you went home and you actually, that's when you started writing songs and in that process, you discovered your voice. So like, if you could go like back to that time, like what gave you the motivation to start writing songs? How did it feel to write music? And how do you relate to that now? When I go back to that time, again, you know, with back injuries, people would say, just lie in bed. That's what they used to tell us in the 90s. Like now it's like, get up and move around and do stuff. Um, even though sometimes you can't, like if you have you, if you blow out your back to a point where I have done, where you move any muscle at all, it's like you just scream in agony. You, Ouch. If It's like, cause they call it throwing out your back. It's But anyway, in my case, um, lying in bed was wonderful. <laughs> 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 like, I, don't, I, have a, I have a capacity to just lie in bed and not, it's like it, it didn't, I, I don't know. Um, I, it's something I guess I needed, you know? Um, but I'm trying to remember what actually motivated me to like pull out the guitar and start like playing it. I know I was listening to music and I wanted to sing. I think that's that must have been the the origin of it, wanting to actually sing. Because mm. I've never really become a great guitar player, but I play well enough to write songs and perform, but it's really about singing, the singing singing songs. Mm. I, I just, I love your singing voice. Uh, it just, there's like so much character in it and it just immediately like it draws you in. And I feel like the more I listen to your voice, like the more I need to hear it. It's just like one of those mm. voices I like think about from time to time. And I'd love to hear more about like what you think of your voice and how your feelings toward it have evolved. That's, that's funny you mentioned that. I was just, I was just thinking about uh, the, the interview you did with John Hyatt. Because oh in, in that, I don't know if you recall, he said like, um, was it Rod Rodney Crowell I, came up to him and said, "Do you like your voice now, or something like that?" Yeah, do you, or you still come hate to, your voice? Do you still yeah. hate your yeah? Do you still hate your voice? That's just very funny. Um, I kind of liked my voice at first. Like, I think I liked the sound of my own voice. There, <laughs> I liked hearing it. I liked feeling it in my body. Because even when I was a kid, I would love just singing a cappella, singing along to the radio. Hmm. I felt pretty comfortable in my voice listening to it. Actually, my speaking voice was more kind of shocking and strange. Like I, I didn't really like the sound of the how I talked that much. Hmm. Um, but you know, it's funny. Then the, the criticism started seeping in. Like at first, it was a pure kind of acceptance of my voice and. I think when I started having to record it, then you start to analyze it, you start to listen to it. And yeah, I became very critical of it. 
Mm. Um, I try to take some lessons when I lived in New York early on before I was ever signed, before I made recordings, because I was start, I was starting to blow it out. Because as I was learning to sing, I, I would try to sing loud. <laughs> you mm. know, I, I didn't, I, I actually, that was like um, a misunderstanding about like how to use my voice. Even though it was valid, I just, it was, it was kind of one dimensional. It was also just like wanting to, literally it was like kind of like wanting to be heard. Let me, let me try to sing loud because you'll hear me. I think it's, I think it, my, my relationship with my voice has become one of acceptance because I've learned how to really, really value it and appreciate it and sort of take care of it, mm. but not in any kind of precious way. Like I've never um, really understood, like I've never had a, a system of, of like exercising it or even warming up, you know, which is not a great thing. Like I think, you know, now that I'm at this age, I'm actually interested in trying to develop it more, which, you know, seems like well, that's kind of late. Like you're, seems like an odd thing to do, but, <laughs> but I, I feel like, you know, we do evolve in different times with, with what we have. And like, I do feel like the, my voice is the one thing that like, nobody can really take that away. Right. Like, I, I mean, life can take it away. Can I've lost my voice at different times or, but it's, it's a very intimate relationship. And it, to me, it is, it's really connected to, to something really deep with, within, within myself um, mm. that I get to express. So I think I have more respect for it. A little more respect for it. I listen to like this EP and I hear like there's certain breathy things. Like I don't feel like I have total control over it. Mm. Which mm. like, is that like, is that, should we be trying to control? Like sometimes I think that's something like we're supposed to do because sometimes in performance, yeah, maybe the maybe the first, even the second song, I'm still warming up, which, you know, maybe that's not great. Like, I don't think it's ever like, well, I don't want to say ever. Maybe it has, you know, I, I feel, I think that's something important to know just for myself. Yeah, I'm not entirely in control of it. Mm. Well, it's interesting that you bring up control because uh, I hear that you're a perfectionist um, who has who learned. Who told you? Wait. Well, <laughs> I think it was you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but you have learned the benefits of letting go of control, like you're just talking mm. about, like when you're writing or recording, or even, I guess, when you're performing on stage. Um, where have you been impacted by perfectionism in making music? Can you talk about how you have learned or are continuously learning to let go and give in to that spontaneity? I love that question. It, it reminds me of another interview that I heard recently that you did with Anais, when she talked, somebody, I don't remember who, but somebody told her to not to belabor her work and to kind of like keep putting it out. I oh, was the Felix. opposite. Felix McTeague. Oh, it was Felix. Okay. Okay. And I thought, wow, I'm so glad that she heard that and could could act upon that. I was really the opposite. My first album there were seven different producers. There were two different major labels, like hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, it was, it, it was just sad. I mean, it was, it was so like grotesque mm. um, because of course, you know, when I got signed, I'd only been playing music for, you know, performing out for about five years. So I really didn't have enough experience or skills to really like perform in those situations and there was so much pressure, you know, it was just drilled into you. The first, you know, the first album is everything. If you don't make the first album that has success, then you failed. There's, there's not, it was very black and white. So there was like a lot of pressure to be, you know, the perfection of success. But of course, you know, what does that mean? You know, if you're writing songs and it just, it just, it was almost an impossible maze. Like, like mm. what exactly is it? You don't know. Like, I don't believe that the record executives knew what a hit song was anyway. If they did, they would have been doing it a lot more often, right? Right. If they had the special formula. Right. And like, great. I mean, if, if somebody had, you know, maybe there, there were people, I'm sure, we, you know, who have had so much success that they would have more to say about that based on their, what they were able to achieve. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but in my own case, um, nobody was like nobody put me in a room with another hit song, you know, a hit songwriter, 
and said, try to write a song. It was like, it was like a mixed message. It was like, you're this very unusual, like that was the whole, like this is sort of the, like, well, it's almost, um, I guess lie is that is that the appropriate term? <laughs> like, well, it's it's kind of it's kind of like it's false. It's it's this idea that you're like you're amazing and you're unique and you're a special creature. I was literally like the word creature did I really heard that? Um, hmm. Somebody said that like you're a, a, yeah. Over at the twenty same, years ago, you remember that still? Oh yeah, because it's 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 very impactful. It affects the whole trajectory of your life, my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it was huge. It was huge to go through that and not be, no, it's not, I'm not trying to like over dramatize it, but um, maybe another person would have pivoted away and recovered, but I, like, I, it's taking, it's taking me so long to, mm -hmm. um, but no, I think this idea that, you know, you're going to have to make your first album amazing. It's going to be successful or you're a failure. And then the idea that you're either going to write a hit song or you're going to be so, you know, but, but, but at the same time, you're, you have to be exactly who you are because who you are is what's like, what's, you know, quote unquote special. It was very confusing because it was like, on the one hand, you're, you're thinking, well, I am enough because I'm here and I'm doing this. But then to be told, actually, it's not really right. We, we should try this again, write some more song. You know, it's just kind of, it, it was the opposite of, um, like building a foundation just based on taking action and like manifesting your work. So like, mm -hmm. like I never really figured out how to just do that thing where you just create and keep putting things out in the world. It all, it sort of trained me at it. And I think I've learned since then to be quicker. I hope that if I get a chance to, to write more music that I'll, I'll, I'll actually get to experience the feeling of like writing something and then putting it right out there. Yeah. But was, I never had that. Hmm. Uh, so in thinking about Carnival Love, the album that you were just talking to, that so much time and money and seven different producers, very labored over type of thing, mm. like how that entire process of, of working with all these different people over the course of all these years, hearing all these different things from two different major labels, how that all impacted your relationship to the songs and how do you like feel about those songs now? Yeah, I mean, it's almost like I feel like the songs are my friends. Like, you did it. You <laughs> well, they never like they they didn't betray me. They they were they were innocent. Mm. They were they were pure. Then they still are. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like there's there's integrity to the songs. I feel like the production of them at times, like in the end, we ended up going even to to some of the demos that I did. The, some of the demos ended up on the final release. Oh, isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Yeah, like the song He Drives It, which is on that album, was was a demo. And the song Yours was a demo, like so-called demos. They're just recordings, right? But um, mm -hmm. they were early recordings that we ended up using. Um, but uh, to your question, I think you were asking about um, like my relationship to the songs, like how that mm -hmm. affected. Yeah, I think the production, you know, they like, Actually, again, I keep thinking about it because I've been listening to a lot of your interviews, but, you know, this idea <laughs> that, you know, you're going to make a recording and it's going to be the ultimate version of that song versus just that's what we did that day. Oh, that's like Chris, the, Christopher Pappas was talking about that. Yeah, yes, yes. And so it's like the ease of that kind of idea versus like we have to make the ultimate version. I mean, talk about setting yourself up. Let's just like, let's have no expectations. That's what we did with this EP when Kimon Kirk, who produced it, brought us into the studio. And he literally like was like, Amy, you got to just do this before this moment passes. Because this moment, and, it, and he was right, because there's certain, you know, you're working with a group of musicians. We were playing out Mike Castellana and Andy Playstead and... You know, I was, I, was go I was actually at the time living in California. So the, the time was like, it was starting to leave. So he very, I thought very generously, wisely was like, let's capture this before this mm. moment disappears forever. So, and I think that's, that's sort of my new commitment to the songs is, is just to allow them to be, you know, with whomever you're working with at the moment and let them just come out into the world and they don't have to serve any higher purpose. They don't have to afford me a living. They don't have to get, you know, make me friends or influence people. Like, mm -hmm. they don't owe me anything.
Mm-hmm. In talking about uh, Kimon Kirk, who produced your EP, he's uh, an awesome musician. Uh, yes. Bass, like I was introduced to him as a bass player in in the Boston scene, but he now lives out in Los Angeles. Notoriously handsome, Kimon Kirk, uh, Very handsome. working on the new EP as we are. Uh, and you said in a social media post, he encouraged me to write while I struggle to make a living as a musician, to stay creative in spite of my resistance and struggles with depression. Kimon was the guy who got excited about my new songs and gently encouraged me, eventually initiating our recording. You and Kimon both lived in Boston. It seems like that's where you first connected back in 2010 and started playing together. And now you both live in Los Angeles. So can you talk about what it's like to have a friend like him in general and how elevating that friendship is because of your musical connection? Mm, yeah, Kimon is a dear friend. We met um, through Dinty Childs. Oh, yeah. Actually, initially, I think uh, he, he remembers that we met in L.A. after I finished uh, You Go Your Way, which was my, I guess, third full-length album mm-hmm. um, that was produced by Paul Bryan. And I was at a show with, with Paul, and then Kimon was there. And then I, I guess Paul introduced us then. But then it was later in Boston when I moved, you know, at the end of that touring for that album. I was back in Massachusetts and I had a gig. I was opening for Mark Cohn and I, I didn't want to do it by myself. I was, I was scared. Like sometimes getting up there just with your guitar or your ukulele is, sure. it's just not that fun. It's just like, oh dear God. For somebody else in the crowd too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I was like, Dinty, Dinty, who can I, who, I've got a show tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, who, man. <laughs> who can, yeah, right? This is how it is sometimes. I was like, I just, I wish I could bring somebody with me. And he's like, call Kimon Kirk. So I did. And I, and Kimon uh, really loved that, that album, You Go Your Way. And so I sent him like seven or eight songs and he learned them that night. Wow. Because he was a little familiar with the album anyway. Uh-huh. So we kind of knew them, but then he learned them. We met before the show. We like ran through them and we got up and, and did the set and it was it was great. It was like from the, the moment I played with Kimon, it was totally natural. There's a certain chemistry you have with a musician, I think, or even a personality. There was something about his, he has a very quiet, humble, kind of supportive, very accepting mm-hmm. because I'm more of a nervous type and he has he's a more calming person. So... That was like a nice fit on on those levels. And uh, he also kind of understood where my songs were coming from. Like, even though overtly you might not think, oh, that's definitely a Rolling Stones influenced song. Like he he could kind of intuit where I was coming from. So he was able to really respond musically in ways that I really liked because they were, Mm, they were coming from, yeah, it was very cool. And then, then we did that, you know, five week tour when we met you and we were with Chrissy Hind and, I mean, I hardly knew him. We were in a van together with a third person, this guy, Mark, from Australia. The three of us, um, you know, traveling like 28 cities in five five weeks, I think it was, sharing hotel rooms, Oof. the three of us. <laughs> wow. And, and I got, at the end of that tour, I mean, I really felt like, honestly, I felt like I didn't totally know Kimon. That was the remarkable thing because he's not he's not a perfectly transparent person. Like you have to get to know Kimon. Mm-hmm. And I feel like after this many years, like I feel like he knows me so well. I feel like I know him very well. You know, like you said, like what is it like to have a friend like Kimon? I, I, I really feel like it's sort of, I mean, again, I don't want to sound like I live in California, but I do. Um, <laughs> he's almost like an, he's kind of an angel. Like I feel like there's certain people in my life. I've been very, like I have had, not a lot of success with romantic relationships, mm-hmm. but I've had certain friendships throughout my life that have been so deep, so enduring. And I feel like Kimon is is in that class of friends. It's just like the, a person that in spite of myself, like in spite of anything I'm doing, he's he somehow shows up for me in a supportive way that I wouldn't expect him to, wouldn't expect anyone to. Like, what was in it for him to, like, show up at my door? So when he moved out to California and I hadn't done any music for a number of years, I had done some things, but nothing that I released. I had this duo project called Onward With Love, and it still exists, but we've never released anything. And that's with a friend, Paul Masvidal, another amazing friend. 
But so, you know, Kimon showed up at my doorstep with th these recordings that we had done that we never mixed. Um, so that I, I'm also kind of hinting at the fact that like these songs were not recorded recently, you know, these were things that came, you know, kind of s were sitting there. I wasn't really ready to release them. And he played them for me because he cared. He cared mm -hmm. about my songs. He cared about me. He's like, this is, this is your work. You know, what do you think about this? And I, I was like, this stuff's really kind of honest. Like, I was surprised. I was like, this is like, like this is kind of vulnerable. Like, this Are these is like, the, what? the songs on the EP? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, whoa. I was like, I, yeah. I, I wanted to put them out, though, at that point. I was ready. Yeah. But it still took a little time to actually get them out there. Were but those yeah, demos I mean, he was playing you? That that's not what the no no those the are the recordings. those were the no those were those those were we had got into the studio for one day and recorded those songs in Boston with Andy yeah, yeah. And like Mike. I wouldn't no we weren't they weren't intended they were not even intended to be demos they were like what we were discussing like just capturing the songs capturing the band okay. capturing us and okay. it was a record but it was not. At that point, I was like, I don't like, I don't really even know if I want to just like, I have to develop some other parts of my life, namely, like, how am I going to make a living? Because the mm. idea of putting out something when I am trying to like afford to, a place to live, mm -hmm. I just wasn't ready. I just, I just needed to work on other aspects of my life. And mm. so wait, let me just, let me just get the timeline down of things. Um, so you wrote as we are you wrote those songs pre-pandemic and were they recorded pre-pandemic as well in yes. boston okay yes. uh and then during the pandemic kimon brought them over and was like let's listen to these and then you were like i want to put these out but i need to work on wait some years stuff <laughs> years so it was it no, like no well let's get close i mean basically it was the songs, I, I, should, should I tell you when they were recorded? Is that not important? Like, I, it's, it's almost like you, there's almost a stigma against when you record music and then put it out. Later. Oh, is there? I didn't, I didn't know that. I guess. Not, not in the plebeian world. Okay, good. Well, let's be, <laughs> let's, that's where, that's where I'm comfortable. I mean, these songs were recorded in 2015. Wow. Let's take that in for a minute. That was like th three lifetimes ago. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess. I guess. I mean, I mean, I mean, I guess. But for me, music doesn't really exist on a on a timeline like that. Yeah. Like that. I guess. I mean, you know, I guess that's very inconvenient for you know trying to be a working artist. That's the mm. trouble. But it know? does clear up. It does clear up a little bit of the timeline confusion because when you were like, I wrote yeah. these pre pandemic. I was like, oh, twenty nineteen. But it was even before. No, that. I so, know. Yeah. I know. It wasn't. It was probably you know probably something I didn't want to put out in a press release to make it the center of a conversation. But this I is a like basic having, folk exclusive. Yeah, we're doing... <laughs> well, you know, it's just like... And I don't know if it's even that relevant or important. But I think in the context of this conversation, I feel like it is mm -hmm. because, you know, it speaks to the, the, the difficulties, just the material difficulties of actually being a working artist and being able to put your work out. Mm -hmm. Um what that entails, you know, having the resources, whether mental, whether physical, whether spiritual, financial. So yeah, there, there's there's sort of obstacles to overcome. Um, so thankfully, we captured this music when Kimon came back. You know, it wasn't even during the pandemic; it was it was before that, because we mixed it in January of 2020. Okay. Whew, right before. <laughs> right, it was right before. Uh, we went to Nashville. We mixed with Brad Jones at his studio there. Cool. And and then when the pandemic hit, I could have, I don't know what happened exactly, but I did, I mean, there was nothing preventing me from putting it out, but I think it was, I just really wasn't ready. I really yeah. wasn't. Yeah. And, you know, what does that mean? You're not ready. You just put it out. What's the big deal? Well, for me, um, it was a big deal. Who's doing the interview here? Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love that you just asked yourself a question and then started answering. <laughs> Keep this going. Is sorry. It's what I do all day, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no. T t yeah, I'm interested to hear, like, what you were saying. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I oh, just no, couldn't no. help myself. <laughs> no, you know what it is? I'm, I'm, you're, you're making me very comfortable, and I'm just sort of speaking my mind, but... Um, I think I just wanted to say 
it was really hard to put this out, Cindy. Yeah. I'm glad you did. I remember I was working at Passim for a moment there. We were doing live streams during the pandemic. And for some reason, I don't know how this happened, but there was like a couple of weeks where like I was like booking the live streams and I reached out to you and you were like, mm. I, I have a day job. I it's This is not going to work out. And I was like pretty sad that. Wow, that I'm really case, I need to but... hear that. Wow, I I can I can vaguely remember when was that? We was it was an email conversation. It was like very early pandemic, maybe like mm. May or April. Um, but I was like, I mean, I totally respected what your response, but I was like kind of sad that I was like, oh, maybe we won't get any more Amy Correa oh. music. But I was so pumped when Bernadette, your publicist, emailed me and was like. Amy's coming out. And before I even listened to it, I was like, I want to, t- <laughs> I'm so excited. I want her to be on Basic Folk and like book the interview right away because I was like so happy. I mean, thank you so much, Cindy. It really means a lot. I mean, I'm, I really am honored that you asked me to do this because yeah. it's a, it's a, it's, it is a big deal for me to put this out and kind of honor the work that we did, you know, Mike and Andy and Kimon yeah. and myself too. You know, these songs are, are really important reflection of a time in my life that I feel like I had to express so I can move on. Like, I feel like I feel really released from oh, this and, and really um, hopeful, hopeful for, for whatever is next, you know, yeah. for hopefully more music um, acting. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. My yeah. eyes are a little sweaty. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I love crying during interviews uh, it's the best <laughs> well i guess we, we both cried a little yeah, bit during listen. this um i do want to talk a little bit more about the song <clears throat> with all of us it's a love song to the artist inspired by the boston period of your life um about a collective of musicians kimon dinty child in that collective who uplifted you with their creative camaraderie which is like that's like from your press release. The words are so lovely. Like me coming from that city and knowing those group of musicians, I really love the way you describe that. So can you talk about that time and what that support continues to mean to you and how you work to capture that spirit on the recording that was actually recorded in the city that you were yeah. writing about? Yeah, all the songs were written when I lived in Arlington and, yeah, in Arlington, actually, and then recorded in Waltham. I remember, you know, Rose Polanzani reaching out to her on Facebook. Like, at the time, it was like the the cycle of Hugo Yoro was over, and I was now, like, really wondering what next. Mm-hmm. You know, the end of that tour was like, this is getting weird. Like, I'm in my 40s, and I don't really have a viable source of income. <laughs> <laughs> love that oh my goodness and um <laughs> you know at the time I I had moved back in with my parents in Lakeville Massachusetts because I was like trying to figure out okay how, how am I going to be in the world again um how am I going to establish myself a home base where am I going to live like how do you do this <laughs> so I ended up um moving to Arlington um my friend's sister had a room, you know, it was that kind of thing. I, I've done that through a lot of my adult life. I finally have my own place now out here in California, which is really quite a, oh, congrats. a luxury. It's, it's really wonderful. It really is <laughs> nice. But sort of getting back, like moving into Boston in that area was really made possible because, because like Rose Polanzani's Sub Rosa, she had like, it was a monthly gathering uh, this, the the Secret uh, Society of Rose Polanzani. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I met all these musicians, including Aeneas, through there. And um, I felt like they really, like, in, like enjoyed me and appreciated me. And that, that was, I never really had that kind of community before. Even in New York, it wasn't, you know, when I was younger, like, we all kind of circulated and knew each other. But there wasn't that kind of like, we wouldn't all have a show together. We were all on stage together performing each other's music. I had never mm. experienced that. Um, so I would say that that period of my life was um, a chance to be a part of, because I think, especially early on in my career, it was so much about me 
in, like in my own mind, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was very, it was very, you know, centered around like me and like how I was going to be able to have success and like what that meant to me or my family and like, oh my God, it was like, it was like not fun. You know, that was the main thing. It was really fun hanging out with the Boston folks. Yeah. Like they had fun. Like we laughed and we <laughs> drank, you know, we, yeah, yeah. which not to say that drinking is, you know, necessary to have fun, but that happened to be part of it at that time. But, um, and I don't drink at all now, which is, which is really fun, which is actually extra fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just really, I have so much love and appreciation for all the musicians in Boston. And then there was, you know, Three Mile Island, which was, mm-hmm. I don't know if we would go for like a week or I don't remember how long it was, but it's like you know, seven songwriter- days. The, yeah, the songwriters would converge and, retreat, and yes. you'd, you'd like, you'd have like a little cabin and, and there was, well, I didn't like the fact that there weren't bathrooms, but anyway, that, <laughs> <laughs> but you'd go, you know, to like in the, you know, with your flashlight, you know, at night and find the bathroom. And the, the main thing was that at night we would, you know, sit around this fire, we would play each other's songs. It just being a part of it, that was new to me. You know, it, it's sort of sad to, to think that it took me a while to come to that. But to me, being part of a music community is a primary thing. Like I, I want to figure out how to nurture that more because I was also that person that didn't make a Facebook post for three years. Like I would just disappear. I, I could isolate so easily. Yeah. You know, like even with this EP, I think the pandemic, like I just fit right. Like I just went, I was like, oh, we're going to do this. Okay. <sighs> That's great. Let's do this. I'll see you guys. You know, I was I've been training for this my whole life. <laughs> I, oh my God, Sid, do you understand this? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, it, it takes some effort for me to put myself out there and to like give and receive in in this community of musicians. I I, I hope I can continue to like nurture and develop relationships because I don't I don't always do it naturally. Mm-hmm. So I really value it. I I'm learning how to do it more and more and. I feel like, um, you know, it's something that, that gives me hope because I feel like, you know, how, how can I be of use to others? How can I be of service? How am I going to, you know, even like, like, like I'm trying to be candid about some of the things that I maybe don't exactly flatter me, you know, like in, even in this interview to talk about like not getting an, a recording out for like years after it was done. Mm. Like that's nothing to like, that's no feather in my cap. But I feel like it's saying, it's saying, I hope somebody hears it and realizes, you know, this, this is a process that can be, a, it's a lifelong learning thing. One thing that I learned listening to a podcast, um, I think it was Mike Ritchie. He played this artist called uh, Lee, is it Will Bealey? Have you ever heard of him? Mm-mm. Texas, Texas guy, um, put out an album in the 70s, mm-hmm. 40 years later, he released another album. Yeah. I thought, then, and it was like it was amazing. Like the music was amazing, but I thought, okay. And then hearing Janice Ian say, you know, her last album, her final album, her final studio album, at least, um, was the first time that she actually made something that she one hundred percent was like a fully realized expression of her talent. Hmm. That blew my mind. Yeah. Wow. Like. And it actually gave me hope because I thought this is a, you know, hopefully a long journey that we all have. And it's very, we all have very unique stories. Mm. And, but there is like, there is this sense as you start to do it over time, that there is this, there is a community, there is a, a lineage and that we're all connected to it on all different, different levels. Mm -hmm. Just keep writing about it in your Michael's book. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's powerful, I think. It's powerful that we can we can plug into that. Totally. Oh man. Amy, before we let you go, will you do the lightning round? Of course, yes. All right. Here we go. <laughs> this is going to be the most fun you've ever had. I know. First question. What is the first song you learned on the guitar? I think it was um, leaving on a jet plane. Mm, good one. Solid. <laughs> what is your karaoke song? Um, 
uh, Midnight Train to Georgia. Ah, I want to hear that. Yeah. You send me a, <laughs> send me a video next time you're doing karaoke. I want to hear that. I'll do. I'll do. Dogs or cats or something else? Dogs. What is your coffee order? Decaf. Really? Mm. Giving up caffeine with, um, I have a, a fluffer, a milk fluffer. So I do um, like the AeroPress with the decaf now. I fluff the milk up. That's what I have. You must live in day. California. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Is it the oat milk? Yeah. My, eh, okay. I like oat milk. I think it's good. Uh, who is your first celebrity crush? Um, Daniel Boone. Was he a celebrity? Yeah. <laughs> because so. I think as my dad used to tell me stories at night about Daniel Boone and Mingo, and I used to picture myself out there with the, with the two of them. <laughs> I mean, nothing, nothing was gay. Just an adventure in the woods with a campfire. That sounds good. Uh, <laughs> first album you bought with your own money? I think it was, I was in Chatham, Massachusetts at a record store and the album was the double album, The Beatles, like the later work. Like there was the red one. Do you know the one I'm talking yep. about? Like the, the red, red one and the blue one. And the blue. I got the blue one. Ooh, the blue one is, that's a good first album. Good job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what was your first concert? I don't know. <laughs> Acceptable answer. I really don't. No, I don't know. I guess it could it have been, um, it couldn't have been David Bowie. It could have been David Bowie. I'm impressed. In the 80s. In the 80s. Yeah, maybe it was that. Oh, okay. What was, okay. Were you going to ask me what my first concert no, was? No, I thought I shouldn't. I'm not the interest. <laughs> you. This is, I want to, though. <laughs> uh, it was Stone Temple Pilots. Wow. In Boston. Edgy. Yeah, totally. Very cool. edgy. Yes. Okay, this is the last question. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? I don't know. I would say maybe um, Yosemite. Ooh, that's pretty. That's beautiful. Yeah. Heck yeah, it it's is. It's very grand. It's 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 you know, it's it's a grand view of things. It's beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Amy, thank you so much. This has been a really wonderful uh, conversation, and it's just like it's just so nice to be able to sit down and talk to you for an hour. And I could do it for for much longer, but we have our lives to live. Cindy, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate your time and and bringing me on to talk about all of this stuff. I, I really appreciate it. And congratulations on releasing the EP. It's it's really awesome. I'm glad that we have it. Thank you so much. I'll see you another time. This week's episode of Basic Folk was produced by me, Cindy House. Our music is composed by Alex Stanton. You can find Basic Folk wherever you get podcasts. You can search for Basic Folk on the SiriusXM app. You can find us on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. Or you can check out our website, basicfolk.com. Talk to you next time. Bye.